All right. Hey, uh, welcome to this advanced technology session. And uh, we actually kind of pulled this all together at the last minute uh, with the organizers. And, and Miki was driving this because he thought that there are only the kind of a games and web and, and IT startups. And now we have these space companies and nuclear technology companies coming from Russia. So we need to show that we Finns also have something. So that's the reason why we are here. And uh, <clears throat> there's actually three other reasons uh, why we at Lifeline Ventures and why I kind of personally invest into the companies like that you are going to see within the next kind of uh, period of, of this session. And they're actually pretty important ones, because if you think about all of the companies you are going to see, how they are different from most of the stuff that you, are, you have been seeing here in this conference, which is also super important. But how are these companies different? The first one is that these companies can save the world. So what you are seeing here is actually something that this planet needs to do. It's mandatory. So, I mean, another game, um, you can probably skip it, but if you don't solve food production for the planet, that's like a serious topic, right? And that's the first differentiator. The second one is that the market is always big, and the market size is kind of a guaranteed. So if I take one of the companies, Zen Robotics, construction and demolition wastes roughly 700 million tons a year in Europe alone. Multiply that by three, and you get the global volume, and multiply that by 100 euros per ton, and you get the total market size. You know, 20 to 30 billion market size. Mobile gaming is 5 to 6 billion. So it's big. So, so these markets are always guaranteed to be big. You will see a, a fertilizer producer today. Fertilizers, 160 billion dollar industry annually. The whole mobile industry dominated by Apple, 120 billion. So these markets are guaranteed to be, be big. Right? And, uh, and, and then the third thing which, which you always need to understand is that the companies that you see here, they are based on a real need. So if you have a nice accessory for an iPhone, it makes your life a little bit more fun enjoyable, and that's why you use it. If you take like bulky bright light headset and you are depressed during the winter, you have a need. You have actually a problem that you need to solve. So if I kind of compare what we are going to see today here compared to some other stuff that we have seen before, there's a huge guaranteed market. These companies will save the planet. And, and then finally, there's actually a real need that they solve. And uh, that's my kind of a brief introduction. I'm trying to be a smart host here and keep the timeline and all that, but... Uh, okay. Okay, so next speaker is... Okay, Maxim Uvarov. Sorry about that. It was outside of the agenda, but we are thinking on our feet like entrepreneurs need to do here. So I'm the one who is outside of the agenda. So uh, my name is Maxim Uvarov. I'm from Skolkova. I'm responsible for the healthcare in Skolkova and for the biomed products. So what is Skolkova? Uh, Skolkova, in fact, for today, it's Russia. It's Moscow. It's uh, 16 minutes driving from the center of Moscow. Skolkova, somebody is telling that Skolkova is a village. Somebody is telling that Skolkova is a city. Me personally, I think that Skolkova is a country. Because Skolkov has its own law made by the president Medvedev, the previous president, not Putin, Medvedev, of Russia. Right now, Medvedev is the prime minister, but he's on the board of uh, Skolkov. So Skolkov, the main idea was to make an innovational center in Russia, to develop innovative products, to return our Russian brains outside, to, to bring them back into Russia, and to bring a lot of foreigners inside Russia, and at the end, to export innovative products outside Russia. So these are like the main goals. 
So there was a new law made for the Skolkova, and uh, in fact, we can, according to this law, we don't pay any taxes inside Skolko. This is absolutely free economical zone. This is first thing. The second thing, we can use all the Russian laws, the current one, and implement inside Skolko, or we can write our own laws if it is important for our startups. Uh, for today, we have 700 companies that already uh, became the residents of Skolkovo. Skolkovo itself, it is 400 hackers near to Moscow. It is split it into four uh, areas, districts. So the first district, it is are in the centers of big, big companies. Microsoft, Intel, IBM, Cisco, all these companies already started to construct their R&D centers inside Skolkovo. Then uh, there is another district. It's R&D for the startups. Uh, it is the district, in this, the district uh, of the Technopark. So the Technopark will provide with uh, offices, with all the services that they need to uh, make the business in Russia. The third district is the university. University is made together with the MIT. I believe you know this university in the United States, in Boston. So the uh, head of uh, the Skoltech, who is made together with MIT, is the guy from MIT, Ed Crowley. The fourth district is uh, the family campus, where the people will live and together with their families. Inside Skolko, we can use as many foreigners as we want, because in Russia, you know that there are some restrictions, some uh, quotations for the foreigners to work. In Skolko, we can use as many as we want. In Skolko, we can import all kinds of products, all kinds of drugs, medical devices that we need for R&D. There, uh, there is no problem at all. So, uh, in Skolkovo, there are, in fact, five main clusters that uh, will implement their ideas that will help their startups. The five clusters are the following. So, IT cluster, energy efficiency cluster, space cluster, nuclear cluster, and biomed cluster. Each cluster has its own strategies. So, you can just go to the internet, uh, to our internet site, sk.ru, Skolkovo and uh, find out about the, these clusters and about their strategies. So inside Skolkova, we can help not only with not paying taxes, with uh, giving offices, uh, with showing Moscow because it's right next to the Skolkova, but uh, we can also give grants. So if the, we can give grants up to several million dollars, even five million dollars. For the startups, it's great money. This money, grant. This is just grants. We're, we don't go into the equity. It's not the debt. It's the grant. Uh, the guys who receive this grant, they just have to match the same amount of money. So if we give them $200,000, these guys, startups, you, you will have to invest the same $200,000. If you found an investor in your company for the same $200,000, you can come to Skolkova and we will give the grant for the same amount of money. The thing is that you will have to make R&D center inside Skolkova. Uh, but you will have to be there physically, starting from the first journey in 2015. Because so far we don't have buildings. The only building that uh, has been opened, it was two months ago by Medvedev, and uh, the construction is going on. So for today, all the startups, they can be located anywhere in the world. Here in China, where, uh, in the, in, in the rest of the world. So, and it doesn't mean that you will have to come to Russia. You will have to get this grant in Russia and to be there. No, before the 1st of January 2015, you can be anywhere in the world. Then it's up to you. If you want to move to Russia, if you want to have an office in Russia, but the main idea is that you must have at least one foreigner. As far as I can see here, it's not a problem for you. We don't ask to have Russians. We just ask that at least one foreigner have to work in Russia starting from the first journey 2015. So uh, there are a lot of good things in Skolko. A part of that, there are a lot of good things in Russia. As you know, Russia, if you look at, I don't know, I believe that somebody already heard uh, yesterday's speech by Pekka Velikainen. So Pekka Velikainen, for example, he's my boss. And uh, I love this guy. He, he made a great speech yesterday. Uh, telling you what is Russia and why you must not be afraid to go to Russia. It's a risky country, of course, but you must not be afraid of Russia. Uh, Russia, if you look at all the rest of the countries inside Europe, 
Germany, Spain, Italy, who will give two digits growth in the next years? I believe no one. In Russia, we have a lot of industries that shows two digits growth. A lot of industries, healthcare, biomed. It's really we are in a startup phase. It's really a startup phase. There are still no laws, and we are writing these laws. For example, we have a lot of startups in uh, regeneration medicine and genetically uh, and genomes. So we help them with writing the new law. So the new law will be uh, made, uh, will be signed by the prime minister probably in March, April next year. And this is what we can do. And it's really the fastest and the cheapest way for you to start something in Russia. And I believe it's also the cheapest and the fastest way to, use, to start something in Europe. Russia is right, it's here. If you need visas to Russia, come to Skolko. We'll organize you visas, it's not a problem. We even can do that. You know that for foreigners, we, uh, there must be some kind of a time to come to Russia, some visa. We can solve all kinds of issues, uh, all kinds of problems that you have. Just don't be afraid of going to Russia, please. And invest in your company and your company. Let's go to Russia. Welcome to Russia. Welcome to Skolko. Thank you. Well, that was very tempting to go to Russia. I just was there before I came to Finland. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Sandbox Industries, which is a company in the US. Uh, we have done, just recently, we did a, a program in London, and we are considering some broader investments across Europe, and I'll tell you about those in the life sciences area. I, um, I spent the first part of my career, about 20, 20 or 25 years, it's getting I feel really old, especially at a conference like this. But the first 25 years in the corporate world uh, with Searle Pharmaceuticals and Monsanto. So I'm very familiar with healthcare and the agricultural sciences. Um, I have spent the last 10 years uh, in the entrepreneurial world and the investment world as an angel investor and sort of a VC. And I'll tell you what I mean about sort of a VC. I guess I could just do that. That's good. Um, at Sandbox Industries, we're a little bit unique. We do three things. We start our own companies, so we create companies from scratch. That's our startup foundry. We also run accelerator programs, and we've run tech accelerators, so I'm very familiar with the sort of things that we see mostly in the other room. And uh, I couldn't agree more with Timo that uh, the world is really great today at being able to find where to get the next beer and to find out how, what kind of music is playing in a nightclub, but we don't have medical records for all the people in a given country. So I think if we can bring some of that technology over to more important things like healthcare and agriculture, um, I think it'll be a better place. But it's a great feeding ground. Those sorts of technologies have applications around the world. In the accelerator programs, um, I'll go into each of these in a little more detail, we run a, uh, an accelerator called HealthBox. And HealthBox is, uh, is a healthcare accelerator with a unique twist from the tech accelerators. And the last thing we do is we invest in companies primarily in the healthcare space, but starting in December, we're gonna do it in agriculture and nutrition. And we do those through collaborative investment vehicles. And I'll tell you more about what those are. So our startup foundry is a little unique. We tried to industrialize starting companies. And we looked at some of the failures that large organizations have, as well as small entrepreneurs. And we tried to take those uh, objections off the table. So to a certain extent, what we do is we do the typical thing of generating a lot of ideas. In our case, every year we generate three or 400 ideas those turn into one or two companies at the end of the year, and we go with those. So we have about five or six, up to about, we've had two exits, so we had about eight companies that we've started 
on our own, through our own ideation, some of those in healthcare, some of those in consumer technology. That's our startup foundry. Um, the accelerators, as I mentioned, the tech accelerator we have is called Accelerate. Um, that's along the lines of Techstars and Y Combinator. We were ranked the third best accelerator in the United States. But I think what's more interesting than that tech accelerator is the one we call Healthbox. And Healthbox has helped 27 companies so far with programs in Chicago, Boston, and we have one that's midway through in London. And it's helping early stage healthcare companies weave their way through the ecosystem of healthcare. So if any of you are entrepreneurs and you have ideas for healthcare, it's not as easy as just knocking on the door of a hospital and saying you have a new idea or a new app, a new app or a new um, uh, concept for a hospital to adopt. So what Healthbox tries to do is it tries to embrace mentors, hospitals, in the case of the UK, the NHS. We try to embrace those as, uh, as a whole ecosystem to help these startups. And so we're going to be running probably seven more programs next year around the world uh, to help healthcare companies get started. And of these 27 companies, 20 are already finished through the program. Um, I'm happy to say that all but one are still in existence. It's been a short period of time, but our goal is to help them survive a year or two on their own. Um, what The point I'd like to make about our accelerators that makes them a little unique, and it's a common theme of what we do, and it's collaboration. So large corporate partners and entrepreneurs rarely talk to each other, and I've talked to a lot of people here, some from the corporate side, mostly from the entrepreneurial side, and there doesn't seem to be a dialogue that's easy. Um, it's difficult for entrepreneurs to talk to corporates, vice versa. So programs like Healthbox are programs that can make that happen, where you can get ideas early on, as opposed to playing the guessing game, which entrepreneurs basically do. They guess at what they think is going to be needed and wanted to be bought at some time in the future. What accelerators like Healthbox can do is help you talk to the strategic partners early in your development so you can pivot and make something that they're going to need and want and support. The last one, that, the last area that we do is something we call a collaborative investment vehicle. It's a unique form of venture capital in that our limited partners are actually strategic partners. So in a typical venture capital fund, um, money is gathered from a source. It could be a government, it could be wealthy families, it could be banks. Uh, and an investor, the VC, goes out and does what they think they should do with that money, reports back every quarter, and sometimes people are happy and sometimes they're not. What we do with our collaborative investment vehicles is we try to get the limited partners, we only select limited partners who are strategic to the area we're investing in. So we select limited partners, in the case of the, our healthcare fund in the United States, our limited partners are pretty much Blue Cross Blue Shield and they're the largest insurer in the United States. So in, in the agriculture fund, which we're closing in December, we'll have companies like Monsanto, like Lilly, like Bayer, and others that will be investors in our fund that will help us with the due diligence. They'll help us select the companies that we invest in. And more importantly, they'll help those companies that we invest in succeed. So in the United States, with our healthcare fund, we had an, a, an early stage startup called Bloom Health. It turns out three years later that our LPs actually wound up making the acquisition of that company. So they bought that company three years later. We started it with an original $500,000 investment. They bought it for $60 million three years later. So they become the buyers as well. Um, so it's a unique twist on it. Again, it's focusing on collaboration. So it's a little different than a typical venture fund. And last point I'm trying to make through this is that entrepreneurs and corporations need each other, and it's really hard to get together and talk. So forums like this are great. Entrepreneurs have courage. Don't think you have to keep everything secret from those large companies. They're probably not going to steal your ideas. They're probably going to help you. Um, it's in their best interest to have the entrepreneurial world um, succeed. The large companies today are pretty much focused they have tunnel vision. They're looking at what they do and how they can do it better. 
and they're not looking off to the side or often behind them where the next changes are going to be made that are going to change the world they live in. So entrepreneurs have to have courage, try to get market access, um, events like this, accelerators, any chance you get as an entrepreneur in your field to talk to the large strategic partners, I urge you to do so. There's just not enough of that going on. And corporations, they do need that peripheral vision. So if you're a, if you're a corporate or a strategic investor out there, um, look around and see, what, um, see, see what's going on in the world. With Blue Cross Blue Shield in the United States, we're trying to make an acquisition of a social media company. And so that you would think that's the last thing a healthcare insurer would want. But the reality is they have to become a consumer company. So the idea of buying a social media agency is, is interesting, and we have to present it to them in a different way. So corporations have to have that vision, be willing to look outside. Um, in effect, corporations need to start to outsource their innovation. If you look around the world, and I talk to a lot of corporates, there's probably billions and billions of dollars uh, in innovation departments, and they don't have a clue what they're doing. Um, they're all trying to figure out what that means. And the entrepreneurs are the ones innovating. So as a corporation, you need to outsource um, and keep this collaboration going. The conference here at Slush has been great. It's a good time to interact with people from both the corporate, venture, investor, and entrepreneurial side. So thank you very much. All right, thanks. So then we move to the companies from, uh, from the kind of the boring investors and all the other stuff. So now we get to see the really cool stuff. I guess that, Pekka, you are going to start, right? I can do that. Okay. So this is the guy who launched Coke in Russia when Yeltsin was kind of chasing the communists in White House on top of the battle tank. So. Thanks, Timo. And that's, that's a little, little while ago already. Yeah, great. Excellent. So uh, my name is Pekka Somerto, and uh, the company I come from is Valke, and, and I'm happy to introduce to many of you who don't know Valke from before uh, a little bit about the company as well as the product. Uh, and, and most proud, we get this to... It's not changing the slide. Why? It's stuck. Anyway, so, so the, I'm most proud about the product and, and the business that we're um, uh, building there. Valke, you see one here. You would see one on the slide and will in a minute. Uh, Valke is a bright light device, and in many respects, it's similar. You can think of it as similar to the big bright light boxes that uh, quite a lot of people these days have, uh, have in their homes, except for a couple of clear differences. First of all, Valke is more effective than any one of those big boxes for the consumer, for the user, for our customers, the difference shows in the time that you need to use the product daily to enjoy its benefits. With Valke, it's 12 minutes a day, and with a typical bright light box, a full hour every day. Uh, secondly, Valke is clearly more convenient. It's portable, it's rechargeable. There's even a cool factor in, certain cool factor in, in this compared to, uh, to, to a big box. And I would never imagine taking a light box with me on a trip to Moscow or from Moscow to Helsinki. This goes in my pocket, just like my mobile phone. And thirdly, uh, Valke is safe. It's, uh, it's a medical device. It's uh, regulated by the European Medical Device uh, Directive. It's approved in class 2A, which means the regulator has looked at the product, concluded that it does what we promise it does, and that it's safe to use. Uh, and compared to the bright light boxes, it causes no eye irritation or, or retina uh, irritation in use. The big idea started many years ago when one of the two founders, Yuso, that you see on the left, Yuso is here also on the front bench. Yuso was studying biology and uh, 
do, he was doing experiments with animals shifting their internal clock with light by introducing light in the mornings. And, and uh, I also discovered that you don't need to put the light through the eyes, but it's enough to put it through the skull and the animal's brain responds to it. Now, it turns out that already since the 60s, there's findings that light is an important part of the human natural environment. It's an ingredient that we absorb in many ways, not only through our eyes, but also directly through the skull. The brain is able to sense light. Now, fast forward a few years, an auntie who's suffering, the other co-founder who is suffering from seasonal depression asked Yusa for advice on how, what kinds of lamps to get for his house. Now, Yusa thought about it for a minute and concluded that actually, Antti, since you're an engineer, you should figure out how to get the light inside your head. You don't need it in your house, but you need it inside your head. And so that was the beginning of the idea. A couple of weeks later, Antti came out of the garage with a prototype, tried it on himself. It seemed to work. And the two guys uh, set out with the Oulu University researchers to, uh, to uh, try it out on real patients. And in the first clinical trials, with 13 patients, 12 of them seriously depressed during the winter time, got cured of the symptoms, and they started the company. That's, that's a pretty much a, a true story. Since then, a lot has gone into understanding better what's going on, how is it working, and, uh, and, and doing the clinical trials with patients. And, and for myself, I organize what we've learned in the last five years working with Oulu University researchers is three things. First of all, that there is photosensitive proteins all over human brain, and they have a purpose. Evolution would not have left them there or put them there if there wasn't a real role for them. And their role is to sense light and tell the brain that there is light here. And it's a natural signal between night and day. It affects our mood and many other things. A lot of the hormonal, uh, hormonal, uh, hormonally controlled uh, functions. Secondly, when we put the light through the ear canals, we've discovered that it's a practical, it's a functional way to deliver light close enough to the brain that the brain sees it, in quotes, or senses it and responds to it. And then thirdly, in clinical trials, we see time and time again that patients get better, they feel better when they're using the light daily, in four weeks uh, of, of uh, daily use. There, there's, there's a clear seeming paradox. It seems almost absurd to a layman hearing for the first time that you could sense light through your ears. And, uh, and so the result is a lot of attention, a lot of interest by press, by media. And with a growing user base of Valke devices, there's more and more people who swear to Valke's name. People who use this are happy with the results. And so there's a growing dialogue, discussion in public, in media, uh, about Valke and about, the, uh, about how it works between those who swear to its name and the few skeptics that they will be in every market. And that keeps the dialogue alive. And we've discovered, encountered this in every single market where we go to as part of the go-to-market activities. So while we've done no marketing to speak of, and we do use social media a little bit, um, we've, we, we've received a lot of visibility, awareness, and, uh, and conversion of that into sales in the market where we go to. Now, we're talking here in this session about products, about physical products, and rather than digital products. And with that comes all of the challenges of the physical world. Uh, this is a product, obviously, it's tangible device governed by the medical device directive. Uh, it's produced. We have a plant, production plant in Oulu, in, in the center of world's engineering, um, I, I believe. And, uh, and, and we have the sourcing, uh, we have the logistics, warehousing, transportation, um, the, the channel, distribution of a physical product. And, and when it comes to the channels of distribution, um, a typical Valke go-to-market or rollout into a market looks something like, evolves something like this. We do start with an online store and we have 
uh, online stores that are serving several countries, many more than in which we are physically in. But very quickly to scale the business, it does require also physical retailing. And so with pharmacies and health channel, we've been able to get the kind of the first step into the market very quickly, then expanding into premium high street retailing. Uh, and then further on into, depending on the market, into specialty channels like travel, as an example. Now, how, how does the business look like? Uh, Valke retails for 185 euros in Finland. Uh, we're now starting, or just started the third year in the market. Um, price discipline uh, is, is pro for the product is very good. Uh, user base is growing. You see the green curve there showing cumulative uh, units that we've sold, a little bit over 50,000 to date. Uh, but it, when you look at the sales curve, it, it has a peculiar shape. And that, that's, that's a function of a seasonal sales curve, seasonal product. And the product is for seasonal depression. That's where the uh, <laughs> roots of it are. And, and, um, uh, and, and so you, that, that's the, hence the shape of the curve. Now, we've continued clinical research beyond SAD, beyond the seasonal affective disorder, and uh, have done studies on, on uh, athletes' uh, sports performance, reaction time performance, as well as students' attention performance, stuff that has to do with cognitive performance, how well your brain and body work together and your senses work together. Um, and we're embarking on a set of studies to understand also the ability of bright light to, to uh, relieve uh, jet lag uh, time difference uh, symptoms. All, all of that is serving to flatten out or to, to uh, de-seasonalize the sales curve. Another important dimension of growth for us is geographic expansion. In the first year we started from the little circle there centered around Oulu uh, selling in Finland. We've since then, last year, expanded, taken the first steps to other Scandinavian countries and to German-speaking parts of Europe, and, uh, and that's just the beginning. Um, finally, we've got a really great uh, team of, of management, investors, and, um, and research experts. Um, the company is based in Oulu, and, and so a lot of the research community is in Oulu. There's a very high-quality research uh, university and hospital in Oulu, as well as other, other medical talent. Uh, and then we've got a great group of investors. Uh, Timo, who's hosting this session, Timo's Lifeline Ventures uh, with Petter is one of those. Uh, Christian Segestrole, Esther Dyson, I saw Esther sitting somewhere here uh, and, and uh, proudly wearing her Valke yesterday. Ansi Vanjoki, Yuri Engström, just to mention a few, and that for us is more than investors. It's, it's, uh, the investors are a source of advice, coaching, and, um, and active members also on the board. I hope um, you've enjoyed this. When you're leaving, if you're leaving uh, Finland eventually to go back to Moscow uh, or, or other parts of the world, remember to stop by at Helsinki Airport, opposite gate 28. Finnair Tax Free Shop sells Valke for 145, which is the best price in the world today to get a Valke, so pick yours up there. Thank you. Thanks, Pekka. Hey, the next company is, is, uh, is very exciting. There's an um, Armenian uh, ambulance doctor who actually moved to Finland, and now there's a company set up on that, and uh, then the Skolkovo guys are trying to get it back to Russia, so... It kind of goes back and forth. So, Ami, please. Thank you. Thank you, Timo. So, good afternoon. Uh, on my behalf, my name is Ami Rubinstein, and I have the pleasure of introducing a company called OptoMeditech uh, to you. And, and one of the things that you had to learn during this conference, if you didn't know it already, is that everybody loves games. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is very different, and uh, what I'm going to talk about is, is that everybody hates needles. Nobody wants to be stuck with a needle, and yet that happens multiple times around the globe every year. In the U.S. alone, uh, 
a traditional intravenous catheter is used about 350 million times a year. And uh, it is the most commonly used invasive procedure in the world. And uh, it, uh, it is also one of the major uh, sources of customer complaints in a hospital. But the way a catheter normally works is that it is a plastic tube that gets uh, put under a vein and then all sorts of liquids and medication is given to you through that. And the way it is placed in the vein is by using a needle that guides the catheter into the vein. And the way it's done nowadays is that the practitioners are visually observing by eye and trying to find the vein. And the interesting part about this is, and, and, and why Dr. Kasparian uh, started to work on this area, is that it's often very problematic. And what he witnessed when he was, uh, uh, when he was taking care of people in the ambulance was that, uh, that uh, he oftentimes had difficulty finding the way in, in stressful situations and in situations where, uh, where the person he was treating had bad veins. Well, it turns out that Dr. Gasparian was not alone. This seems to be a very common problem, and one of the things that I've witnessed since I've started working with the company is that everyone has personal experiences of this, or at least they know people who've had problems with this. And personally, I can say that, that I, I, I feel ashamed for my mother that she has had to chase me through hospitals when I was young because I was always running away from the people trying to stick me with the IV catheter because I was so afraid that it would hurt. And oftentimes it did. And when we started studying this, uh, an interesting fact is that the studies show that in 30%, over 30% of cases, the first time this catheter is tried to place in, into a human being, it fails. And uh, when it does so, it can get very quickly very nasty. Here are just a couple of examples of what happens when this job is done poorly. And yet, this happens in 30% of cases, 300 million catheters placed in the US alone. It happens over 80 million times a year. And uh, this is a problem that really has gone unaddressed for a very long time. Uh, more so when you have these problems with placing the catheter, it gets very expensive very fast as well. Uh, the price of a single catheter in the US market is less than $1 or roughly $1. But the price and the cost for a hospital to place the catheter is somewhere between 32 and 70 US dollars per attempt. And if the first attempt by the practitioner is unsuccessful. They will change the product and they will try again adding another 32 to $70 into the equation. If they're not successful the second time, they have to call in another nurse to attempt it again, adding another 32 to $70 into the equation, let alone the hassle and everything else that happens in the hospital. If the third attempt is unsuccessful, then what happens is you have to go into much more serious ways of entering the vein, and once again, the cost and the patient discomfort uh, is much higher. If you have a complication, you get a bacteria, you get an infection, you are hospitalized for a period of time for two weeks, the cost can go easily up to tens of thousands of US dollars. And all of this because underperformance of a product that costs less than one dollar each. And just to state that this really happens a lot, uh, studies show that the insertion failure, the first three attempts not being successful, happens on 12 percent of cases with oncology patients. So it's not alone that people have to suffer through uh, the tedious chemotherapy, they also have their veins destroyed by these catheters. 
So what Dr. Kasparian has developed is technology. We have three patents pending, two of them related to these catheters, one of them related to blood collection needles. And with this technology, what we can do is we can give an instant indication to the practitioner when they are entering the vein. And by instant, I mean instant. The only technological development related to entering to the veins that has hit mainstream over the last years is called rapid flash chamber. But the rapid flash is not a rapid flash. It happens over time when the blood comes up the needle, and if there is some tissue in the, in the blood, it can get clogged very easily. But we have technology that will give an instant indication when the practitioner has hit the vein which means that we can guarantee a higher success rate for implementing the catheter with a very simple solution that will make it easier, safer, and faster for the practitioners to enter uh, the vein. And there are a number of areas where this is going to be extremely helpful. I already mentioned oncology. With cancer patients, their veins are fragile, they're getting smaller, they get number of catheters, so their veins get destroyed very easily, and we can bring help to those oncology patients by making sure that uh, they don't have to suffer through this discomfort. I already mentioned ambulance and emergency situations where this is really a big problem. In the United States, as in Europe, home care is becoming more and more uh, common. So people are getting uh, catheterized in their homes uh, with nurses who are not used to placing these devices. Um, with the elderly people, with pediatric, with the obese people, with obesity problem becoming uh, stronger and stronger all the time, there are a number of areas where this uh, innovation will become very helpful to the patients. And in addition, if we look at the different hospital types, different treatment facilities, there are a number of uh, uh, values that we can add to them, a lot of value we can add to them and their treatment processes and their cost savings through being able to handle the catheterization in a more humane and effective way. Uh, as a company, Optomeditech has just uh, finalizing, is just finalizing uh, our A round of financing, we have been able to secure some very prominent partners to help us develop this fur, uh, business further. And within the next year, we will be uh, producing a proof of concept study in Russia uh, to show that our product really works the way it is, uh, uh, the way it is designed and the way, we have, uh, the way we have used it. We are also building a commercial strategy for an entry to the US market because we do see uh, the U.S. market as our main objective due to the fact that their uh, hospitals are used to paying for value. They look at the whole cost, not just the cost of the product. Another important thing is that uh, the hospitals get uh, reimbursed based on customer satisfaction. And as said, if this is the main cause of customer dissatisfaction in hospitals, we can also improve the reimbursement rates for the hospitals and so on. Uh, we are also doing the necessary certifications that we can do already at this stage within the next year. And then, then fourthly and, and, and finally, we are looking to find the right production partners for us when we go into the commercial stage. So we will be responsible for the design, but the production and product development final stages will be done by our partners that we are looking to finalize now. So it's very safe to say that we are in a, in, a, in, a, in a happy stage where we are ready to take off. And it was uh, very intentional that we didn't put a SAS plane in here. Uh, we are about to take off. And, and one of the things that we are looking to do with our prominent partners and with the team we have in place is to make sure that our tra trajectory would look more like this than the actual plane takeoff. So, that's a little bit about Optomeditech. I hope this was uh, an interesting presentation to all of you. And, and once again, thank you for the opportunity to be here in front of you today. Thank you. All right, thanks. So Ami's solution is still so secret that he didn't tell you what it is, because there are still patents that need to be finalized. But in next year's class, you will get it. So next, we have. Uh, Yufo, uh, who is one of the founders of Zen Robotics and 
also men who didn't bring rock and roll to Finland, but rap music. And I always introduced him like that, and he hates it because he says that he can never get rid of that and be like a proper businessman. I can never get rid of Timo. <laughs> okay, everyone silent. Here I am. Uh, my name is Jufo Peltoma, and I'm an alcoholic. No, really, I'm from Zen Robotics. Uh, seems that this one doesn't work. Let's try from here. It doesn't work either. Okay, so now we would like to start a video. If Can I go now? A planet drowning in waste. Everything we build turns to waste. Over 900 million tons of CMD waste. But there is hope. A small startup with guts, artificial intelligence, industrial robots, and a market opportunity to kill for could save the entire. And now I would like to continue with the presentation. I want to emphasize that the computer infrastructure here is not provided by Zen Robotics. Okay, so Zen Robotics was founded in 2007. Actually, the very original idea of, of the company was to make something cool with robots, and we didn't have a business plan that was much, was much, uh, would have been much better than that. Uh, still, we did have some, uh, or I didn't, but a few super intelligent PhDs had some uh, experience in artificial intelligence and robotics. So, uh, we decided to call customers before we invented this super product and, and we actually ended up calling to some 200 customers around Finnish industry and, and uh, let's say that after more than 100 meetings and listening to customers and their problems we understood that okay we must probably uh, recognize really difficult objects and, and manipulate them with robots. Then after a while I actually I uh, tend to stay up very late and watch Discovery Channel and this this actually was great because I happened to see a, a documentary about a B, huge B-52 bomber plane getting crushed into small pieces in a huge shredder and, and a really bored looking Mexican guys were, were kind of picking the waste that was coming out of the shredder so I thought that okay there was there, there can be our product and we named it Zen Robotics Recycler 
Right now we have 30 employees and, and almost all are proven geniuses. You are actually looking at one example who isn't, but uh, most of us are. Uh, some of them are a bit weird. You're actually looking at an example of that right now. Uh, our company is thinking green. We are 95% uh, of the robotics in the world is uh, um, funded by military and we actually belong to 5%, so we are kind of part of the good guys. We are pretty well funded, we just got an investment round from a company called Invus. They have something like 4 billion euro fund, so I think they can even give us more if we behave. Uh, about our team, let's not go into details, but we just managed to snatch uh, uh, Juho Malmberg, who is one of the most prominent CEO characters in Finland. We, we stole him from Connect Corporation, and, and the CEO of Connect Corporation is beginning to kind of be in cool terms with us. Uh, uh, let's say after these few months that you has worked with us, we have pretty, pretty experienced posse. We have, for example, our chair, chairman of board is Jorma Eloranta, who's a well-known Finnish industry tycoon and, and a cool guy and really intimidating, and I'm afraid of him. Uh, we have nine PhDs currently out of these uh, 30 people, and they are, they are not just average PhDs. In, instead, they are really kind of top-notch, uh, even, even when you look at them internationally. Uh, some, some patents have already been kind of uh, uh, put in motion, and five of, uh, five of us has already done this before, so we have grown uh, technology companies and exited them to, exa for example, Google and NVIDIA. So we can at least pretend to know what we are doing. Okay, so about the problem we are solving. There's 900 million tons of construction and demolition waste in EU alone, in the EU alone. So Europe pro uh, produces this much uh, construction and demolition waste. Then uh, customer customers end up landfilling half of this waste and they pay 100 euros per ton when landfilling the waste. So we are about to change that. Currently, there are no real means to process the waste. So there are, for example, manual pickers. Uh, that's not that's very problematic. They are not well motivated. There are health hazards. The, uh, let's say that cancer is not very far when you pick asbestos and and mole and whatnot. Uh, manual sorting and excavators are uh, some solutions, but they are not really good. Our solution is called Zen Robotics Recycler. It's actually uh, the most important thing in it is the brain. So, so the robot is uh, here, it's a standard industrial robot, but the very, very important thing is that no one before us has been able to control a robot in such a uh, complex and chaotic environment. Usually robots do seven million times a year the same, same movements and, and the, that kind of a, uh, doesn't apply to waste picking. So we have been really successful in, in creating the the uh, brain for the robot. So that's the most important thing. Then rest is just usual mechanics and technology. Uh, our first recycler is uh, already installed at uh, our pilot customer, Sita uh, Finland's uh, site at Viikki, some seven kilometers from here. So it's already operational. We have currently some 20 distribu distributors in 50, uh, they are covering 50, uh, 51 countries. We have closed two deals, actually, to Holland and Belgium, and, and we have lots more to come. Uh, actually, we are hiring right now, so if you know someone who's really, truly genius at, at what he does, so you can kind of uh, recommend us. Uh, and at the end, I would like to so show more videos, if it's possible, with the system. Let's see. remember these PhDs from Zen Robotics. Last time, they developed robotic recycling to save the planet. This time, they're in it just for the money. For the customer. To make the customer. 
customer happy, the Zen Robotics Recycler can do incredible things. It can pick a range of valuable materials from construction and demolition waste. The customer can sell the recovered material and save in disposal costs. This makes the math easy. Metal. will be the same anymore, I guess. And uh, uh, I mean, this was really good. So next we have a, uh, another team of, from a company called BT Wood. And if no robot will be similar, no wood will be similar after this company has kind of uh, won the world over. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Timo Reista, and I'm coming from the company PG Wood. It's certainly pretty hard to follow Zen Robotics. I will not tell you about mobile games or any, any, any space tech. Instead, I will go to a, a very natural and basic business and talk to you about wood, wood industry. And why do I do this? Just because it's a huge business. And BT Wood is a company which is specialized um, in development and production of uh, all new environmentally friendly ecological uh, chemicals for treatment of wood uh, for the purposes of, of food industry. Why wood in industry? It's, it's about 150 billion euro business. And even a small company is, is able to bring added value to this business and make, make, uh, make real nice business. Uh, why uh, these things are, are top important today? The key issues, like everyone knows, are ecology, environmental issues, uh, lifestyle trends. People, of course, uh, appreciate uh, carbon footprints. Uh, healthcare concerns, all these uh, issues uh, favor moving using wood in building business instead of steel and concrete. On the other hand, everywhere, especially in EU, laws and directives keep on coming every year with more limitations uh, towards uh, hazardous, toxic or harmful chemicals. Companies, they do have a need to do branding. Every, every uh, industrial company wants to brand themselves green. Green building is an issue. And of course, uh, wood industry, being a traditional industry, they, they also they, they have a need to, to bring added value to their products. 
So uh, there, are, there are many reasons why there is a market demand for new, uh, new uh, tools to make wood more, uh, more um, uh, or better, better material to be used in, in, in building and construction business. There's a clear market need. And uh, what is the solution of BT Wood here? BT Wood is actually the first company being able to provide the markets, the wood industry, new tools, new products uh, for treatment of wood, improving the wood uh, quality as such, making it environmentally friendly, non-toxic, and, and better material. Uh, in, our, in our portfolio, we have um, products, fire retardants, that is, is to make food fire safe. We have industrial preservatives and surface treatment solutions. Uh, those are used in order to make wood uh, tolerate UV, weathering, uh, uh, mold, bugs, and, 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 and that kind of a stuff. Something that is, that is a huge business also is anti-termite agents. Well, not here in the slush, but, uh, but in, in southern countries, that's, uh, that's uh, about a six billion euro business yearly. The world is changing also that way that uh, there are a lot of industrial innovations. Uh, companies and people, they want uh, ready to use uh, materials and components for building. These uh, pictures represent uh, engineered wood structures and components, and all these components uh, are, are, are good, uh, good for our, our new chemicals, so we treat them uh, to be fire safe, and, and we treat them with preservatives. This is a typical customer side. So we are providing our, our new chemical solutions uh, to wood manufacturers, which are major companies. This specific company produces plywood. And actually, only plywood is a huge business. It's, it's about 30 billion euro business out of the 150 billion euro business, which is the uh, wood products markets totally. So uh, a, a, a remarkable segment. And, and, and uh, plywood is used and can be used in, in major buildings, public buildings like schools and, 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 and so on. Uh, this is one example of our key customers, Metzawood, uh, a leading European company in, in, in plywood business. They launched this year uh, the first fire resist, uh, uh, spruce fire resist plywood product, which is, is treated with the BT wood technology. So we are uh, in, in more than 10 billion euro chemical business. We have a competence and IPR connected to uh, research and development and, uh, and, and, and great uh, innovations in this field. And our clear target is to become a leader uh, in, in this business field in producing environmentally friendly, ecological, new generation wood treatment chemicals for industrial use. Uh, right now, we, <clears throat> we have been financed with, um, by, by public financing, financiation and, and by private investors. Uh, we are a weaker company by Cleantech Invest. And uh, during the first uh, half of next year, we are approaching uh, our A financiation round and we are looking for a financiation uh, between two and four uh, million euros. So you're very welcome after this presentation to grab me by the shoulder. And uh, I'm very happy to, to go on, on for further discussions. Thank you. All right, thanks. So, so the next one to present is Ari, and uh, he has a extremely interesting company. He he doesn't have any kind of a science background, but when I 
first met him, I kind of listened for his science talk for three hours, and maybe I'm that bad in listening that I actually thought that he must be some type of a microbiological doctor. And then when we walked out, I asked that, you know, are you a scientist? So you're a really good salesman being a scientist. And, and, and then I learned that he's not a scientist, but he knows his stuff, so. Okay, thank you, Timo. I don't know if there is anything left for me after Gen Robotic because they are also saving the world. And uh, uh, can I please uh, change this slide? Uh, this is the last, actually. That's the first one, yes, thank you. Um, so it's this, uh, uh, the arrow here. OK, thank you very much. If there, if there is anything left from the Gen Robotics to save the world, but, but I also, I'm, I'm feeling a bit stupid that, you know, somebody's coming here on stage and, you know, with a straight face telling everybody that I'm saving the world. I'm saving you, I'm saving you, I'm saving everybody. I'm saving even this frog, which is living in the rainforest. The rainforests are something which is disappearing every year. But maybe with our innovation, we are able to save this guy. But before going into this presentation, I want to address a few of the things that you really need to change that you can say that you are able to save the world. I would say that we are soon facing a very serious uh, uh, problems concerning the food production. Food production challenges, we will have three. One is definitely that there is too many of us soon on this planet, 10 billion almost, in 2050, 9 billion plus. Second is definitely a, uh, a climate change itself. We will see a dramatic changes in there pretty soon, within a decade or two. And the third one is the energy crops. Energy crops are occupying the land, cultivated land, year after year, more and more. And that will compete with the food production. Together with this, I mean, we will face starvation quite soon. And this was actually the idea when we were starting to think that there must be something that we are able to do. And um, this was then bringing us together to develop something. The other thing is also that, of course, the food that we are able to live, we also need to fight simultaneously against climate change. So we need to do something with the energy. Today, the renewable energy in, in, in petroleums like green crude and uh, bioethanol is not made in a sustainable way because they are competing with the food production and destroying the nature. But here it comes. We have developed a bioprocess using organic waste. And this is where we are producing fertilizers. And the company behind this is a doctor corporation. Let's have a look on this, how it works. We have a uh, doctor bioprocess which is taking in waste. Basically anything which is organic, nitrogen uh, rich. Slaughterhouse waste is a very good material, food waste as well. There is a one-third of the food that we are dumping to the landfill every year. That's an amazing amount. Even more, there is a slaughterhouse waste uh, available. I can take even the grass from your backyard mall, uh, lawn sorry, <laughs> uh, and put that into our process and produce these three elements, energy, we will produce electricity and heat, of course, to our own process needs, but uh, also so much that we are able to supply that outside of the process. Our process don't uh, produce any CO2 emissions. We have zero CO2 emissions from our factory, you could say, or from the process. Then. We are also producing ammonia from there. Ammonia is actually a nitrogen. It's a form of nitrogen, you could say, or nitrogen in the form of ammonia, very liquid one. And phosphorus. These two items are key elements that any of the crops are able to grow. If I'm taking this 
away from the uh, usage today uh, from the fertilizer industry, we will cut down by 50% of the food production. So it's very crucial that we are having this. But even though this is zero uh, external energy needed, zero CO2 emissions, 100% organic, organically biological way produced, I'm not going to give these elements into the food production direct, but indirect. I'm going to give this to algae. Algae is one of the most promising new technology to produce green crude oil. 50% of the algae biomass is oil. Comparison. Palm oil can produce astonishing 6,000 liters green crude oil per hectare per year. Guess what algae can produce oil per hectare per year in known, today's known technology? Around 100,000 liters. It's quite obvious to say that yes, this is where the energy production will go. We in the doctor, we have thought some new innovations for algae production alone. Putting these nutrients, those key elements into algae, they are already in the most favorable form for algae to grow. It will actually explode the algae growth. Today's technology is pretty much using for algae grow a wastewater from a source. There is a lot of nutrients in there, but the nutrient con uh, uh, um, concentration is very low. In the one cubic meter of water, there is not that much nutrients. We will boost the nutrients into the algae so we can shrink even uh, the growth per hectare. It's been calculated that to be able to supply the whole need of petroleum for transportation in US, you need to occupy around 0.5% of the land from the US to be able to supply that. That's amazing. That, that, that's how efficient the algae can be. It don't need to have a cultivated land. It can be in a desert, for example. But here in a doctor, we have done some innovations already here, which are on the way for patents. Our bioprocess has patented already. But with all this, we are able to produce astonishing 400,000 liters of algae oil per hectare. It's unbelievable. I'm telling everybody, we are having pretty big keys on our hands to make the change. And the change is here today, together with you guys. We can share it. What does it mean? It means that this stuff, this stuff here, is being used for bioethanol production. Food, uh, corn, sweet potato, weed, I mean, the list is endless. Food is being used for bioethanol production. We need that because we need to reduce the fossil uh, 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 burning so that the, the carbon emissions won't get too high. We need to reduce that. So I understand that this has been, how can I say, the midway solution. But when the algae production is coming here, we are liberating these land masses back to the food production where they belong. What happens? We won't face that big starvation which is behind the door where I started. And what happens to that guy in the beginning, the frog? I would say this also a bit dangerous thinking for the uh, palm oil producers. And the jungles are most likely coming back because we need them. They are our lungs on this planet. We need the lungs, otherwise we can't breathe.
Thank you very much. My name is Ari Ketola. I'm a CEO in a doctor corporation and saving the world. Thank you. All right, so next we go into the capturing, I guess, energy from the sun. And uh, there's a lot of technologies around this, but what you will have here next is, is a truly unique piece that you can fit into today's technologies and kind of ecosystem on, on solar power. All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jari Varjotia. It's a great pleasure to be here in Slush and share the story of Savo Solar to, with all of you. Especially uh, since, uh, well, even though the name of the happening and the expectation of the weather this time of the year, we don't have the slush outside, which is partly through the global warming, unfortunately, which is advancing faster than anticipated, as we have seen this week for the, in the headlines. Luckily, we have a solution, at least a part solution for this, and it is solar energy. Uh, we have the uh, limited amount of power if we just only could use it cleverly. The yellow box there in the picture shows the annual solar energy yield. The sun is radiating to the earth, and the small box in the right corner is showing how much we are consuming. So we actually should use only a very small fraction of the solar energy to solve the energy problem for good. We anyhow know that for the next 30, 50 years we need to utilize all the energy sources we have. Uh, but the more we are able to use free and emission-free Solar energy, the better for us, for the globe, and, and for the next generations. When talking about solar energy, everybody usually thinks photovoltaics, electricity, and forgets solar thermal. Even though the solar thermal actually has much better potential or bigger potential than PV, the energy consumption from the energy consumption of the world uh, half is going uh, to uh, heating and cooling, which can be seen in the chart left. And for heating and cooling, solar thermal can be used with better efficiency and lower cost than photovoltaics. And the market is also huge. It's billions of euros only in Europe and, and multiplying when you go abroad. Solar thermal systems are, can be used and are used in, in home applications, domestic hot water, and uh, uh, heating space, as well as industrial uh, process heating, cooling, district heating and cooling systems, as has been done already in large scale in Sweden, Denmark, Austria, US, some to mention. And it's important to notice that, for example, in Denmark, the large area collector fields used for district heating, they don't get any more any subsidized. They don't need to do. The energy companies are doing that for good business. And the, Payback times are short enough to do that type of investments. The story of Savo Solar starts from the PVD sputtering coating line. This coating line is 35 years old, old glass coating line that was found uh, 15 years ago from Ohio, transported to Finland, and then uh, transferred to 
make coating of mobile phone covers, different coatings. And during, after 10 years that this business was moving more towards other continents, it was again modified to make the best selective optical coating for solar thermal absorbers. We have a unique coating process in the industry. We are able to coat different size absorbers as complete units up to size 18 square meters, meaning six times three meters as shown in the, in the left side of the, or right side of the uh, slide. What we got as a result, we got the best, most efficient absorber and collector in the world. And this can be seen here when you do the comparison of, of how much a collector is producing energy per square meter kilowatt hours annually. And uh, our collector is giving outstanding values compared to any other competitor in the world. Of course, the question is that why from Finland, north, where we have a lot of sun and, and a very promising solar thermal market, is the best collector coming from? We can summarize the answer in three points. We have a patented optical nano coating, which is having a top class optical properties, very good absorptance, and then it's very stable in high temperatures, meaning longer lifetime, more stable energy production throughout the years. Then we have a unique coating process, having capacity for one million square meters, which is significant capacity in the, in the markets, and then we have a capability to design the absorber so that we maximize the uh, energy yield and minimize heat losses. The company is three years old, and the cornerstone of the innovation and the company, of course, is the team. We have around a little less than 20 people with six different nationalities. We have a couple of Italians, one German, Portuguese, Spanish, Mexican, even people from uh, Savo area, and the Finns know that it's the culture mix is then quite difficult, but we have been very successful in that sense. We have a couple of three PhDs in material sciences and very long, wide experience in international operations. We have established the industrial scale operation. We have facilities, factory, coding line. We have processes in place, certificates, and uh, the company was established to make export sales. So Finnish markets are completely too small only to, to be here. So we have so far sold in addition to Finland to Japan, South Africa, several countries in Europe, uh, German, Austria, Slovenia, Czech, Belgium, Belgium, Russia. And now in a couple of weeks we are delivering to France, Spain, Denmark. And since we have brought something completely new to the markets, as has been said, uh, okay. All right, sorry, wrong button. Our customers and other parties are testing our products and verifying whether we have been able to, whether we are able to keep what we promise. So far, we have been very lucky. Well, I don't know lucky, but everything has been turned positive. Every test has shown that we have really talked the truth. For example, our South African partner has been, did a four month test uh, last spring, day, autumn, and said that they, the performance of our collector was 33% better than the best competitor in the markets. So this has always been, well, nice results. And for example, in South Africa, they ordered one con container of the collectors immediately. One of the best verifications, and of course, marketing tools have been also the InterSolar Award, we received last year, 2011, in Munich for the full aluminium direct flow solar thermal flat plate absorber. That has opened a lot of doors to us and the whole industry knows us throughout the world, which is beneficial for a small company. So we have established our position in the markets and we are in a very rapid growth phase and we are looking for employees, partners, investors to participate 
into this growth. Thank you very much. All right, so next we have uh, Feodor uh, presenting a case, and uh, he's actually one of those very few people who has been angel investor, you know, for his job in Finland. There's not too many people who are doing angel investments for a living, and Feodor is one of those. Um, here, actually, in this case, I would just like to say that, I mean, here you can see the kind of a waste business and waste management and all the logic, which you have in Zen Robotics, you have it in here as well. So somebody has waste, it has negative value, and, and then with different technologies and, and processes, you can turn it into a highly positive value. So keep that in mind while you are listening for the next case. Okay, hello everybody. I'm the last one, but hopefully you're, you're still awake. So, um, Timo already introduced me. Um, in addition to being an, an angel, angel investor, I, I also am uh, a partner of Cleantech Invest, a management company of a, of a small Cleantech fund. And we have, we have nine, nine investments of, uh, in our portfolio right now, <coughs> and Alternate is one of them, which I'm going to pitch right now. So the problem we are solving um, is, uh, is about ashes. So there's lots of lots of ashes coming out as a, as a byproduct from, from power plants around the world. This is just a, an example of what of bigger, bigger power plants for between 100 and 400 megawatts. They produce about 10,000 10, to 40,000 uh, ton of ashes per year. And, and this is, this is a, a problem waste that you, you can't dump anywhere. And, and actually you have, to, you, you have to pay waste tax for, for each ton, <clears throat> even if you take care of the ashes yourself on your own property. So it's about 50, 50 euro per ton that you pay. And um, another problem is that there's actually a lot of nutrients in the ash that you could use, but there are also some, some uh, heavy metals and other, other things that make it unusable as such. So the agri agriculture, <coughs> agriculture industry really needs nutrients. The, the ground, the earth is, is uh, de deprived of, of nutrients all the time when we are we are having this uh, heavy um, heavy agriculture, and uh, you usually usually put in something like like 230 to, to 300 euros per hectare uh, in, in fertilizers today, and you, you could use you could use the ash products, the ash nutrients for, for that. The the <coughs> third thing that or the other thing that you get out of the ashes are the, the silica, the silica products that you can use in the concrete industry. So in, 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 in the uh, cement and, and asphalt and earthwork, earthworks, for, for example. And it gives, gives the concrete a better consistency in many cases. So our solution to, to this problem is, is a method, a method that we, we uh, uh, treat the ashes with. And we get out 5% of the ashes is actually nutrients that we can separate to a, to a nutrient, uh, nutrient uh, uh, liquid. And 95% of the, the ashes is, is uh, silica. Uh, <clears throat> and the silica that, is, is, uh, that we get out of the ashes is, is a really fine uh, homo homogeneous silica that can be used for, for special purposes. Um, and the nutrients is actually it's a wide scope, it's a whole, whole range of nutrients that the, the plants need 
for growing better. So compared to, to artificial fertilizers, this, this is not comparable at all. Uh, there has been tests showing that, that the nutri nutrients from ashes uh, <coughs> are actually much more efficient in, in, in growing plants than, than these artificial fertilizers. So after we have processed the, the ashes, it's not uh, a problem waste anymore. So we, not, we don't need to pay any waste tax. So the ash, ash producers or, or the power plants, they actually pay us to treat the, to ashes. And, and we, <coughs> so we, we get paid for, for the raw material and we get paid for, paid for, the, for the products that we make out of those. And um, the addressable market, um, first of all, as I said, we, we get paid for the ashes. So in, U, uh, in EU, uh, the handling for, cost for, for ashes is about 10, 10 billion uh, uh, euro market. Uh, then the fertilizer market today is it's about, you probably heard it already today, 160 uh, million, or billion, billion dollars. And here's just a few figures from, from Finland, how much, how much woods and, and fields we have that, that needs fertilizing, um, if not each year, uh, year so, if, um, so regularly anyway. And then for the further, further production for, for farm animals, uh, there's a huge need for, for uh, nutrients. Then the cement, cement market, is, is, uh, it's about uh, 3 billion um, it, 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 there's produced 3 billion ton, tons of cement each year globally, so the total market is about 100 billion euros. Okay, competition. Um, there's direct competition all, uh, actually only in, 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 in other ash products, so there's one company called, uh, called um, Ecolan, or FA Forest, actually, Ecolan is the product that make granulated ashes that you can use in the forest. But you can't use them in the fields because they are not fulfilling the requirements for, for, uh, for, for nutrients uh, used in the, in the fields. So they are not, they're not competing in, in other places than on forest fertilizing. Then there's uh, indirect substitutes, as I told you, artificial f fertilizers, they are not as efficient uh, as, as uh, these natural nutrients. And Yara is, is a, a big Finnish company in producing artificial fertilizers and could be a good customer for, for us as well. So the business model is simple. simple. From one ton of uh, ashes, we get 1.2 ton of, of uh, uh, nutrient liquid and uh, 0.95 ton of of uh, silica. And the prices for these vary a little bit depending on, on, uh, uh, on, the, on the power plant and, and on the ashes and so on, if, if they have their own treatment for ashes. So it's between 20 and 50 euros per ton for the ashes. Um, the actual cost for, for us to treat it, it's quite low. Of course, we need a, a 120k uh, investment for, for for this unit for each uh, um, bigger power plant and that has their own fixed costs. Um, but for the, for the nutrient, we, we can get, get up to 1,000 uh, 1, uh, euro per ton. So, so that's a nice, nice uh, amount of money. And for the silica products also, for some special purposes, it's up to 600 euros per ton. So, the scale is quite quite big. Uh, we probably will uh, be moving in the lower end in the beginning, but then uh, working our way up to 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 make more more valuable pro products later on. So we sell actually to three different industries: to the power plants like Yvaskyllan Energia. Uh, to big farms or, or fertilizer and fodder product producers, uh, fodder producers like Raisio Agro, and uh, then the cement industry like, like Fin Cementi. 
So the state is right now, we, we have used a, a pilot unit for a year now, uh, made some, some um, pilot samples for, for testing and, and certification purposes, and uh, now we have the, the real uh, industrial scale unit ready to be, to be um, uh, in production later this month. So <clears throat> we will start with uh, uh, up to 50% of the ashes from, from Keljonlahti, that's in, in Jyväskylä. Um, that, that means about 15,000 15, uh, ton a year. And we will ship the nutrients to, to local bigger, bigger farms and, and silica first for only earth wor works. Then we have negotiations going on with, with about 20 power plants, uh, many nutrient buyers like Yara and Raisio Agri and so on, and some silica users. The business looks like quite, quite nice. We're heading for a turnover of, of 1.5 million ne next year, and, and a couple of years later about tenfold. And as, as you see, we don't, we don't really need very many units to come up to, to quite nice volumes. Then the funding, so far it's been uh, half a million private and, and almost the same amount of public money. And we still have some public funding for, for next year. And uh, late, late next year we, we are seeking to raise two, two to three million. Uh, that was my battery probably. Two to three million uh, extra funding uh, in the uh, end of the year, and we are we're planning to be cash flow positive um, at the beginning of 2014. So I guess that was most of, more or less my my last slide. Um, a couple of words of of the usage of the funds. Uh, mainly, we will use it for for sales channel development, um, certifying, uh, verification of of new products development of, of uh, higher value products uh, and, and then of course a little bit of R&D related to that. Questions? Any questions? Anybody want? So do we still have a one presenter from G-Wind around? All right, very good. So I'm the last after the last. Yeah, but not the least. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so our Russian friends are away. They left us. Do you still have any energy around? I see everyone in the, completely in a sleeping mode. Maybe we should all get up and just refresh ourselves before I'm uh, boring you for seven minutes. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and if you can turn down a little bit the um, volume. Thank you. Excellent. W what am I pushing? Okay, cool. Thank you. So, money from thin air. Uh, we can all make money from thin air. Just imagine that each one of us can own, produce, consume, and sell clean energy. G-Wind is not only about a fascinating uh, technology, an excellent product, but it's about a whole new way of thinking of how energy should be done. So, wind, wind power energy is a huge industry. It's about 100 billion and growing. Now it's dollars, it will become euros. And um, I don't think I really have to present this industry. They're talking about humongous numbers, maybe not, no, not so much as the fertilizers, but it's big enough for me. So let's look at what the, comp the, the industry is, is facing and where are the challenges for ourselves. Number one is, of course, cost of, um, of energy. Everyone is very criticized about, about the need to subsidize wind energy. We're talking today about a cost of about 25 to 40 percent more than the grid parity. Grid parity will be the coal, the gas, the gas power plants, etc. 
issue number two or opportunity for us is um, environmental impact. They have, uh, turbines today are extremely big, very noisy, not in my backyard. And a growing issue, a hugely growing issue, is burden on the transmission grid. Um, wind power, like, like any other um, renewable energy, is a fluctuated source of energy, and the grid likes a steady uh, sources of energy. And therefore, actually, there is somehow a, a slowdown, and projects are delayed because there is not enough a grid, grid uh, capacity. Germany alone needs to invest 30 billion euro in order to meet the needs for a grid by 2020. And therefore, they injected <clears throat> the prices of energy in such a way that two thirds out of the kilowatt hour today in Germany is going to the grid, and only one third is to cover the cost of production. So, so what do we want to do? We want to bring the um, the wind energy were were back where it is belongs, and this is the, near this uh, very happy boy. And why is happy? Because he will actually can control, he can own, and it, the energy will be at his own at his own um, um, uh, backyard. Why that? And and how that is possible? For this, you actually need the right the right turbine and here is the beauty i'm sure that you're all falling off your back from the beauty um, the flyfox is a game changer flyfox is a game changer because number one is by far smaller is a very very quiet wind turbine you can barely hear it and actually what we are saying is why wind turbines should be white my daughter she's eight years old she wanted pink and why not the kindergarten um, we'll, we'll paint them, and now we are going to Porsche Design and ask them make it look even better. So actually, what we are saying, we can bring back the wind turbine to live near near people, so people can consume them. They can be in their in their own in their own uh, uh, environment without actually disturbing, but being part of the environment. So it's all about B 2 C square. It's B 2 customers and B 2 communities. It's all based on a, on a, on a full aerodynamic uh, uh, patent, which is very unusual in the, um, or very rare in the wind industry. I will not bore you with the details. It's by far simpler, and this is correct to any vertical axis wind turbine. It is vertical axis, so what actually we are doing, we are flying wings around a shaft. That's what we are doing. The difference between this vertical axis turbine and the majority of others in the world, and there are a couple of hundreds of them, is that this one, for different reasons, uh, can be upscale. The 99.9 .9 majority of the rest are not upscalable. So what do we have in terms of simplicity? We, we have today only three moving parts, which is the blades, which is the gearbox, and the generator. We are going to remove the gearbox, and we have a wind turbine with only two moving parts, that's all. Now, in addition, it can be placed down on the ground, on the ground level, and then you also have a completely different operating code. I, I cannot see your watch, forget. <laughs> um, so, it is by far more reliable, less moving parts, just to compare, a regular uh, wind power um, uh, system has 15 moving units. It's by far smaller. Here we are comparing it, uh, apples to apples, 20 kilo unit to our 20. Well, it's actually going up to 30 uh, uh, kilowatt uh, unit. And as you can see, in terms of height, it's, it's close to half the size. And most important, the swept area, that's the area that actually the wind is going through, is about 40% smaller. That means it is by far more reliable. Also, we painted this in red because this, these tips are the source of, very, uh, of a very big noise and we don't have that uh, problem in our, in our um, um, turbine. And it's producer, producing wind by far lower uh, uh, cost. We're talking about 20 to 25% lower than the industry today. Actually today, due to the cost of, uh, um, due to the, cost of the uh, transmission, we can compete in Germany with the grid. 
history? Well, it's a slow tech. It took us 10 years to come where we are. We invested so far in the, in the, in the um, um, development, 10 million, 10 million euro, all from um, a private money, not only from my pocket, but I'm one of the first angel investors. And um, we, are, we, are, we are nearly there. And what do I mean by that? We are now building our beta out in, out in Riga. It has been invented by two Russian professors in Riga. And we are going into five pilots in Norway, one of which we are now <coughs> negotiating, two from me in Israel, that's where I'm coming from, and one with the National Laboratory of uh, Spain in, in a micro grid system uh, environment. We are going to be very, very focused, and that is going from small, small scale to medium scale uh, turbines up to around 850 kilo. And we leave the big, the big um, turbines to the big boys. I have time? We leave this to the big boys. We'll go to, to, to the segment above the one mega where all the wind farms uh, exist only with a strategic partner. Focus, very important. Business model, smart grid integration. So it's not only that we bring the turbines close to the consumers, but they can talk with the grid back and forth. Also in terms of energy security, here in Finland you think and probably you're right that en energy is going to be there forever. That's not the case in many, in many places in the world. New York, uh, in Israel we have a lot of problems. It's all over the world there is a problem with security of energy. And when you have a local source of energy, you have security. Off-grid, Africa, developing countries, and we are going to implement that uh, uh, next, next, uh, next year. Here you can see an example of application how, how wind power can work with, can work with a, a bank battery. In this case, it's a company called Better Place. That's only for illustration um, because they have, they have capacity to store energy. This is the tribe. Um, the only weak part of the tribe is myself. I'm, I'm a completely new, um, new entrepreneur. I was investment banker for 20 years, so I became from investment banker into, into a, a, a clean tech entrepreneur. All the rest of the guys are very experienced in what they are doing. And we have very strong partners. We're actually the first ever startup that Citibank uh, agreed to, uh, to be our, his uh, um, financial advisor. That's a little bit what has to do with my background as an investment banker, but still, they, they drilled us left, right, and center. So in a way, our next round of, of financing, and that will be next year around 20 million euro, is kind of secured because they will lead that round. We're working very close with ABB. Um, in all the engineering uh, aspects, and we're very happy to work with Garad Hassan. They are the McKinsey of the world of, of, of wind, and actually we're working with their principal engineer in order to, to, um, to perfect our, our turbine. Poiro is a wonderful Finnish uh, company, and uh, I'm out of time. So, we, Geowind is the power share company, and I thank you very much. Yeah, that was a really good ending, a highly interesting company. And here you can see like how long can it take and how much sweat and capital it can take. But then the market is, of course, uh, huge at the end. All right, hey, thanks for everybody staying to the end. We are probably one-fifth of the crowd that was here in the beginning. So thanks for, for staying until the end and, and enjoy the rest of the conference. All right.